morning everybody. Um, for a start, just to put us into um, where we are about in the city, um, there's a little building um, just up towards the, the right um, left hand corner of the picture, um, which is the one that we're sitting in. So our large scale Hungate excavation is just a, um, about 100 metres that way and the fosse is just behind us. Um, a little bit of a, um, a kind of Warning at the beginning, um, the Hungate project is a very rare beast. So when we're talking about community um, engagement in developer funded archaeology or development led archaeology, um, this is a five year project um, and the biggest ever hole that's ever been excavated in York. It's not something that comes around every year. Um, the previous large hole was um, Coppergate, which finished in 1981. Um, so you know, when we're talking about what we've been able to do here, this is a very rare project. Okay, um, what I was asked to do today um, was to kind of um, cover a sort of more warts and all, sort of lessons learned kind of thing, and not just stand here and go, weren't we brilliant? Everybody does this, like we were great, we achieved all these amazing things. Um, whereas um, we did achieve many amazing things on the project. We, we think we had about 25,000 visitors overall within five years, um, and we've done various things. But I'm not really going to um, dwell on the achievements, I'm going to dwell more so on some of the lessons learned. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've been banging on for quite a number of years, as many people will be able to tell you, is that um, health and safety um, on development-led sites is always going to be very tight, whether or not we're under CDM, um, whether we're quite far in advance of um, construction now, we don't have to be under CDM, um, but we may be um, expected to work under CDM regulations. Um, and um, Obviously, if we're going to take um, volunteers, um, community archaeology teams and um, other groups onto sites, our clients are going to ask us um, how we're managing that risk. Um, and um, there are some sites where we're never really going to be able to um, maybe take communities. One of the major things down at Hungate was the fact that we have a, a gas works site um, which has a major sort of contaminated land aspect with it. And we were never going to be able to have community archaeology within that contaminated land aspect. Um, lots of like hideous hydrocarbons and that sort of thing. Um, but our clients are going to expect us to show that we are doing risk assessments and that we are assessing the risk of bringing um, non-professional staff onto site. We were asked on a number of occasions, especially when we wanted to take young people, so school children, people of school age, out onto site how we were going to manage that risk and we had to produce um, specific risk assessments for it. But the good thing here is, the positive benefit that I think comes from the major lesson learned um, is the fact that risk assessments are actually open doorways. Um, don't think of them as that sort of, oh, I have to do another risk assessment. Um, you think, right, if I do a risk assessment for this activity, this might actually allow our clients to then open the doors and we'll get other things going on. So. Um, Risk assessments can be used as a positive and they can open it up, um, and, um, but definitely on development-led sites it's always going to be an expectation for that health and safety management. Um, once we got onto site, uh, we had a structure where we had um, two days a week put aside um, for community archaeology. Um, and this was a Wednesday and a Thursday. Um, but we thought that really not everybody can access midweek um, projects, things like that, and we should do it on a Saturday as well. And believe it or not, the Saturday sessions just fell flat on their face after a few months. Uh, and this kind of came about because we were really surprised. Our assumption was that people want to come and do things at the weekends. Um, and one of the lessons that we learned and we took away from the project was the fact that people are so time limited now um, and there's a lot of family pressure, um, be that with grandparents helping out parents, parents with families, um, work-life balance and things like that. That actually, um, with the, the, the Saturday event that we wanted to have, um, the numbers were low to begin with and then they just started to fall away. So, Saturdays didn't work, it was quite surprising. Um, and then within the community archaeology team, when we had something like um, the Wednesday Thursday system going on, people could come from both days, they could pick one or other, within the community team, we actually had found that some people just couldn't work together. That was their own um, take on things. Now, we often work with people that you don't want to work with, but we're professional archaeologists. We're expected to work with people who we don't necessarily see eye to eye. But within the community teams, they don't have to. If they fall out with somebody, they can fall out with it and not really worry about the repercussions. Um, and so uh, just as an observation, a multi-day project allowed people to avoid each other. 
Um, which uh, it, it, it worked for us and it worked for them. So um, it's just something to be aware of. Um, and what? Well, yeah, believe it or not, not everybody wants to dig. I just don't understand it at all. Um, coming from a, a sort of hardcore field archaeology background, um, but. Um, not everybody wanted to go out there, get wet, get cold, get dirty. I mean, what's not to enjoy working in York in January? Um, but um, we found that, yeah, um, people wanted to do other things. And so we had to sit back and we had to think about how we got levels of engagement and community engagement and lots of different other ways of getting people involved through post-excavation processing and artifact analysis, or at least introducing handling an artifact analysis. Um, archive research, census data. We had a fantastic project done on um, the, the census work um, because we were doing a lot of historical archaeology. Um, but this takes time and effort. And obviously, um, the, there are always going to be budget tensions um, when you start to take staff time out of the digging holes process and leading into different elements of community archaeology into those different um, sort of lab-based, archive-based and classroom-based activities. So we had to really carefully think about how we use our staff, because that has cost expenditures, um, and then do we balance out, right, we're going to have less holes being excavated, but we're going to have um, a lot more further research being done by the group. And this also comes about from the group themselves saying, we'd like to do X, Y, and Z, not just dig. So that does build tensions into it, and you have to manage that tension. Um, working with young people, are always going to bring um, extra work, um, DBS checks, um, um, which is basically the new name for your CRB checks. Um, the demands that the education system will have, um, working with young people, you know, so that's people under the age of 18, and children, and this is in the eyes of the HSE, um, people under the age of 16 will, will come with extra um, health and safety um, measures involved as well. Kids and their access to free time, um, is limited, um, and then producing extra resources at a child level or a young person level, not producing them at an adult level, um, and then of course the big thing is really inspiring young minds, the reason why they're getting involved and why we're getting involved. It, this all takes extra work, and in this environment we have to remember that extra work is extra cost, and um, there will always be cost impacts with these things. Um, one of the most rewarding but possibly one of the most potentially sort of uh, risky activities that we undertook was working with um, young people doing justice reparation. So these were young criminals who had been given um, justice hours as part of the reparation process. Um, we took them out onto site. We actually had to have um, some basic defence training so we knew how to deal with them if there was any threats, physical violence and things like that. So that's um, a major thing. Um, and then I, I certainly wouldn't have taking the project on, and this comes back to something that was said earlier by Kate and, and other people, we're not social workers, we don't have social worker skills, and in this situation, um, the chap with the blue hard hat in the back um, is a police officer, he was seconded to the youth offending team, um, and we had professional youth offending team staff working with us as well. I would never have taken this project on if I didn't have the support of the city's youth offending team and um, having a, a seconded policeman. The minute you tell the kids um, that he's a policeman, you, you get a, a, a lot better to buy him, funnily enough, than just saying we're just archaeologists. <laughs> um, but two things came of it. We won a, a highly commended from the Colas Awards, and bit better, and this comes back to something else that somebody else said, um, about um, long-term impact. Um, one of the young people, or when one of our archaeologists was on site just last December doing a watching brief, a dumper truck driving off in the distance stops, Chuck comes running over and says to him, are you an archaeologist? And um, Ben, who was on site at the time, said, around and said yes. And then um, it was one of the young people who had done their time doing the justice reparation, now working as part of the construction crew on the new development, actually took his time out to come and talk to the archaeologist out on site to say, I've done some of that archaeology and I've done it as part of the youth offending team system. And that just little moments of that, sowing those seeds and being able to see those little benefits come through were very rewarded, but it was a very risky activity. Working with um, 
physically and mentally disabled, the less able people um, obviously has extra demands. They might not be able to access sight, um, no matter how wheelchair friendly, accessible friendly we can make a site, it might never be good enough, especially when you're digging a site that has thousands of medieval pits and you end up with a lunar landscape, um, it's very difficult to um, access it. So we have to think about other ways of um, doing um, community involvement and engagement and with the, the One Scene Theatre Company um, and the, the group here, it's a group of um, physically and mentally disabled people who run their own group. We didn't tell them anything to do, they basically came to us and said, oh, we'd like to come and see the site. And then they went away and done some archive research and then they put a play on about it. Um, Haven Lane was one of the lanes that we excavated on site and we, we uncovered some of the foundations for number four Haver Lane and then they went away. And that activity, a very lateral activity, which I must admit I wouldn't necessarily have thought of, led to fantastic benefits and uh, two nights sold out at York Theatre Royal um, and it was wonderful. But again, it's all about lateral thinking and getting people to think through um, opportunities that we traditional archaeologists might not necessarily think of. Creating access for older people. Um, again, I've mentioned terrain, and that was that proved to be a barrier on a number of occasions. Facilities, um, you know, access to toilet facilities, access to dry, seated areas, things like that. Um, extending time, so making site available after hours or at weekends for visits, things like that. Um, the health of the um, the elderly. Um, and, and again, coming up with alternative approaches, which obviously meant maybe in some cases less holes in ground but also um, they couldn't necessarily access the archaeology. Um, in the background of the bottom image, um, there are paintings that uh, these people have put together based on the Viking heritage and the Viking archaeology of York. So we were using archaeology and Jorvik um, as inspiration. And then this was a community art project that became a public art project. This was on our um, hoarding. Um, this is kind of like a lesson learned but no, before I even got to this project. I don't know how many people have ever visited archaeology sites that are behind hoarding and the hoard and the, the portals are at one level and kids just can't see through them. Um, and, and shorter people, there are shorter people out there. Um, I'm potentially one of them. Um, and um, so one of my lessons learned from previous work um, was the fact that if you're going to put portals for viewing portals into it, um, make them at two separate heights so that uh, taller folk can see it and then um, the, um, the people of shorter stature or uh, children can also use them and see them without having to um, climb on other people's backs. Make it again as risk-free as possible. Um, and there was um, always a tension between um, doing site tours and putting up information boards. We found that information boards were fantastic but they're static and they can't answer questions um, whereas um, staffing um, site tours allowed people to ask questions, things like that again, again has a cost expenditure. So we're constantly balancing those two things as we worked through the very early years of the project. And then um, our community involvement led to um, Lendleys who have Community Day every year and they're celebrating their 20th year of Community Days, um, doing a lot more extra work with the communities in the, in the Hunger area because they, they saw the added benefits that we were able to bring to the project. So that was very quick, and um, there's a lot of information in there, um, and our lessons learned, I think, come of the fact that undoubtedly within development-led um, archaeology, there are things that we can achieve, there are things that we're never going to be able to achieve, um, be that because of contaminated soil, other health and safety issues, um, it's not the appropriate type of site, um, and um, not all of the community team will want to to do all the work that we're expecting um, because they have their own aspirations. This comes back to things like sort of uh, acknowledgement and qualification and training and things like that as well. Um, and there are weaknesses and strengths and benefits in their group, that community archaeology group, which we are part of, but we have our own strengths and weaknesses. Like I say, we are not um, social workers. Um, we don't have certain amounts of skills, or, or certainly I'm not a social worker. And so um, it was great eventually to be able to work through that whole process where both the community archaeology teams and the engagement teams and the outreach work, we learned 
the skills limits and that they had, but they also learned ours. You know, I'm not an expert in Neolithic Britain, for instance. Um, and so when people are coming up and ask me questions about Neolithic Britain, although I want to blag, I would just you know, say I know very little about that. So um, I, there are skills and limits even in my knowledge. Um, and, um, but overall, it's worth it. And if we can do um, community archaeology on specific chosen, well-chosen development sites, and we have to have buy-in from our clients, and this ha is always done, I have to say, we have to give um, a big um, thank you for um, the local government archaeologists for getting involved in this process as well. Um, this all came about because of a Section 106 agreement within the, um, the, 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 the plan and development plan, um, which just asked for public engagement and, um, and, and education. A few simple words, public engagement and education. And we were able to make all of this out of it. But again, this comes through the development planning process, so our, uh, our local government archaeologists are already key as part of that process. Thank you very much.